so many years of catastrophe. More than six million refugees, it could be you and your family. Thoughts from your own man, your history. We are the people, and this is our time. Stand up, sing out for Palestine. Ah, welcome, welcome, welcome to Palestine Today. I'm your host, Captain Wells, and I want to welcome you, welcome you to Palestine Today, a radio program dedicated to news about what? Palestine. And news about Palestine is something you won't get in the mainstream media. You rarely find it anywhere on your radio dial, and particularly your AM radio dial, but you can find it here on KCAA. Palestine today. My co-host is British journalist and campaign filmmaker Harry Fear. I'm delighted to have Harry with me. And Palestine today brings you the unfiltered, that's right, the unfiltered truth where you will get nowhere else in the mainstream media. Well, what I want to say is that we only we may only have four more shows left because we have to pay for our airtime. So we may only have four more shows left. And so I want to make an offer to you. I want to make an offer to my listeners. If you take the healthy body challenge with me to get fit, to get more energy, to lose weight, heaven knows I need to lose about, what, 20 pounds, probably more like 25 pounds, but I won't admit it to anyone. If you take this healthy fit challenge with me, you will contribute, one, to yourself, to your health, to your fitness, to your goodness, and also you will contribute to Palestine Today. So if you'd like to keep keep the show, Palestine Today, on the air, take the healthy fit challenge with me, and if you refer three, I know this sounds ridiculous, but it's true, let's give it a try. If you refer three other people to take the healthy fit challenge you will get this package, this Healthy Fit package for free. Just refer three other people. So go to palestinetoday.my90forlife.com. That's palestinetoday.my90forlife.com. So after that, now I want to welcome my co-host, British journalist Harry Fear. Hi, Harry. How are you? Kathleen, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you so much. Uh, given the tumultuous situation in Syria and Egypt and Gaza, it kind of plays with your mind and your mood a bit. But despite this, I'm optimistic that this show will offer some interesting information for our listeners this week. Sounds fantastic. Well, why don't we get straight to the show because we have a chock full show. We have three guests. We're going to hear three interviews. And the first is with Kyle Casey, who is an American in Palestine. So Kyle, welcome to Palestine today. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Harry, for this opportunity. I'm happy to be here. So the first question I want to ask you, Kyle, is what motivated you as an American to go to Palestine? Well, the first time I came to Palestine was a few months ago, and it was only a short trip. I was only here for about a week and a half, and I absolutely fell in love with the place, with the people, with the culture, with the sites, with everything about the place and I knew that the American media is not giving an accurate or even remotely fair assessment to the American people or to the world of what's going on here in the occupied territories. So I felt it's my responsibility as a moral, decent human being to come over here and try to document as much as I can of the abuses and the inhumane treatment that the Palestinians are subjected to every day and have been for the last 45 years. So, Kyle, is your connection with the place um, just a humanistic one, or is it personal or religious? It's a bit of all three. I mean, when I came here, it was, it was fairly esoteric. Um, it was fairly innocent. I mean, I'm, I really enjoyed the different climate. I enjoyed the different culture. I enjoyed the different language because English is my native language and I come to a country where Arabic is the primary language and I was kind of taken aback by that but it's got an endearing quality and um, of course I've got my own personal religious uh, attachment to the territory, to the region, to the land as well as I've got some personal friends here whom I've been very fortunate to meet and spend time with. So let me ask you, Kyle, exactly where are you in Palestine? Well, right now I'm visiting a friend in the West Bank city of Tulkarim 
because I was uh, I was given information about a fire in an Israeli chemical factory that was completely unreported on in all forms of media. I've seen only one article in one Arabic um, one Arabic article in one media outlet, and that's it. Um, I went around with my friend and a journalist from the Electronic Intifada yesterday, and we took photos and conducted interviews, and it was a shocking experience, to say the least, to see the destruction of this factory and its effect on the, re the surrounding community. Do you think uh, the average American really has any actual capacity to, to imagine the the suffering and the horrors and the, 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 the depressing practicalities that, for example, you just mentioned. I mean, do you think that the media gives any real chance for people to, to, to imagine or see the reality, the profundity of the reality? By no means. There's just no way to put it into words, the humiliation that Palestinians are made to suffer on a daily basis. And it's not just isolated incidents. It's there, it's, it permeates every fabric, every facet of their lives. And it's heartbreaking to see it. And it's enraging to see the complicity of the American media and all foreign media as well. I haven't seen any, any better reporting from Arabic media sources, from European sources, or American sources. It's all uniform lock in lockstep mm -hmm. as if mm -hmm. there's just a complete blackout on the suffering and until Americans have ever any uh, unless you speak to any Americans who have ever lived under a military occupation Americans can't even can fathom what that means because Americans are more used to being the occupiers not the occupied and so so Kyle you're from Chicago you're an American you're seeing two perspectives uh, a country occupied as you said and you've lived unoccupied, so to speak, actually, literally unoccupied. So what is the message that you would like to give American listeners? I would encourage American listeners to turn off their televisions, turn on their radios to Palestine Today, and, to get, o and to get over here, to get over here while you can and see it for yourselves, because until you've experience the reality of living as a Palestinian, you can't even possibly begin to fathom what life is like. You can't fathom what life is like. Is there anything else you'd like to ask, Harry? Um, actually, I had, I had an amazing question, but I was kind of blown away by, <laughs> by what Kyle just finished with, and uh, I, it's gone out of my mind. That's okay. So, Cal, I want to thank you. Um, how long do you plan on staying? Are you living there now in Palestine, or is this sort of like a temporary visit? Or what, what is your status in terms of your residency? Well, in terms of my residency, I'm currently living a nomadic life in the West Bank right now. I'm traveling from city to city, place to place, and experiencing all Palestine has to offer. But I've already made a decision that... I want this to be my new home. Kyle, my question has come back to me, uh, and it touches on two things. Have you ever been to Gaza or planned plan to see it? And also, in the West Bank and your experience there, could you in some way depict the security image to people who, who might not be able to understand? I mean, well, actually, how dangerous is it for you to be there? You invited people uh, you know, and, and uh, suggested for them to, to visit, but people will, will want to know what the risks are. Absolutely. Um Regarding your first question, no, I have never been to Gaza, but I would love to. I would absolutely love to visit and to get the same experience I'm getting in the West Bank there because I know it's two completely different realities on two different levels, but similar in nature. And regarding the second portion, um, the, the security apparatus in the West Bank is – I'm not going to describe it as a war zone, but it definitely could be – it could be hearkened to as such. Um, when you're driving along the road and you see military vehicles pulling up and you see soldiers standing everywhere, 
it, it it's a chilling it has a chilling effect and my blood ran cold the first time I was driving and I saw a sniper tower and I saw a man in it and I thought to myself that man could have me in his sights right now and I could die at any second and nobody would know. And what do you just get used to it now or you never really get used to it, but you do grow accustomed to that constant fear, and it's always in the back of your mind. And it really helps you put yourself in the Palestinian shoes when you realize that this is what they grow up with, live with their entire lives, and some of them even die with. And it's heartbreaking, to say the least. It's heartbreaking to say the least. Wakal, I want to thank you for joining us here today from Tulkar in Palestine, uh, on Palestine today. I really want to thank you for taking the opportunity to join us. You're an American in Palestine, in Tulkar, which is a small city in the West Bank. Is that, is that correct? Correct. It's in the northwest portion of the West Bank, just east of Netanya. Okay. Thank you, Cal. And uh, you're always welcome here. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to now we're going to go to a pre-recorded interview because everyone is concerned about the possibility of the United States striking Syria. This is a huge I mean, can you imagine us going back into a war in the Middle East despite the fact that John Kerry said a strike on Syria would not be literally or characterized as a war? I think it is an act of war, and this is something that we're going to ask our third guest, whether or not a strike on Syria is an act of war. But before we bring on our third guest, Rania Masri, we're going to hear our pre-recorded interview with a Syrian. Her name is Mimi, and this was conducted. Why don't you tell us about it? Tell us about it, Harry. Uh, well, there's not much more to add. You've hit the nail on the head. But um, actually, there's an introduction in the recorded interview. But uh, I spoke earlier today, about seven hours ago, um, with Mimi Al-Laham, who is a Syrian uh, sort of video blogger. Um, and it's now uh, well past uh, her bedtime, so to speak, in Australia. So we had to catch her earlier today. I hope people find the interview uh, interesting. Okay, so, Joe, we got the interview. Thank you. About four days ago, rallies were held in the Gaza Strip against U.S. threats of aggressions on Syria. In the next segment of today's program, we'll speak with Mimi al Lahan, a Syrian who is a symbol of social media resistance against interventionist Western propaganda. She's a Syrian nationalist, and she's currently based in Australia, where she spends her waking hours following the news about her country's so-called civil war. She regularly video blogs and appears for media interviews. In fact, she's currently working on her PhD. Her online alias is Syrian Girl. You most likely have heard of her. Mimi, thanks so much for coming on Palestine Today. Thank you so much for having me, Harry. Uh, looking at the latest developments with regard to uh, this proposed chemical weapons eventual handover, you're against this plan, right? Why is that? Well, I think it could be very bad. It could be good. You know, we have to wait and see. I was initially very hard on it because I could see that it's kind of a quick fix or a patch up that will eventually, down the line, we will face the same scenario, we will face the same attack. Only when, once we do, we will no longer have our deterrent weapons. We will no longer have um, an answer to Israel's chemical weapons so, uh, or Israel's nuclear weapons. So, in a, in a, in a way... What the Syrian government and the Russians are trying to do is appease the United States and Israel by giving them really what they want all along, which was Syria's chemical Syria. weapons. Yeah, yeah they, well, you know, in 2004, the, the U.S. approached the Syrian government and Assad and said, just as they approached Gaddafi and said, you know, we have our eyes set on you, so we would like to normalize relations, here's a list of demands. One was opening up the economy, one was removing the Syrian school uniform from a military uniform to a civilian one. And I think those ma demands were kind of agreed upon. But one of the demands was to remove the stockpiles of chemical weapons and sign the NPT. And Assad said, okay, well, we'll put in a proposal at the UN where the whole Middle East can sign and ratify this NPT, and we will strip all the Middle East of WMDs, including Israel. And of course, the Americans ignored this and vetoed it. And here we are, 
years later, after the invasion of South Lebanon in 2006 and the attack on Gaza in 2009 and Libya's gone, Iraq's gone, um, we are left now with what is clearly a West-funded insurgency and with an Israeli agenda to balkanize Syria and to take the chemical weapons. So we were faced with basically the answer between giving them up, you know, or being shot. And personally, I would rather have seen us defend ourselves now while we can, while we're strong enough to, uh, and in, and with whatever we can, stand up for what is our rights, rather than concede. And who knows what will happen next? Is it going to be worth it? I mean, one of Assad's demands is for them to stop arming the ins- and funding and fueling the insurrection. Will Indeed. they do this? And, and also another demand that there will be no U.S. or Western attack. I mean, he's never going to get that guarantee, is he? Well, in the short term, they will not be. And I don't think actually that the Americans wanted to attack. They really just wanted the chemical weapons. I mean, the, I know that uh, they, they may... Th- they may think that it's unlikely that Syria and Iran will retaliate, but there's a chance. And they, they probably don't want to risk it. And they didn't really believe that it would come to that because they believed that there was going to be some kind of diplomatic fold. And what, what about so, this, this phrase, seven countries in five years? I mean, you just alluded to Libya and Iraq and the kind of more sinister Um, wider context. Can you just explain this phrase, seven countries in five years, to people who don't know anything about it? Well, it was General Wesley Clark that said in an interview that he spoke to someone uh, about attacking Iraq, and he said, you know, oh dear, we we just gone into Afghanistan, now we're attacking Iraq. And he said, well, actually, it's it's a lot worse. The plan is to attack uh, to bring down the government and, or, or take on seven countries in five years, and the list was uh, included, not in this order, but included uh, Libya, Sudan, uh, Syria, Iran, Libya, did I say Libya? Yes, I did, Afghanistan, Iraq. So um, I'm sure I'm missing one other one. But all of those countries, all of them, in, ex- with the exception of Iran, which everyone says is next, Indeed. Have been attacked in some way. So it's Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Iran, Somalia, and Sudan, and Iraq. That's, that's Not correct. in that order. Yes. <laughs> but, Not um, in that order, no. The, from the evidence you've seen, uh, talking now about the chemical attacks, and I mean, I, I'm sure you agree the chemical attacks is just a red herring because the actual tragedy here is not the chemical attacks, but it's the not chemical attacks, which are the majority of the violence. But f- for the chemical attacks... Based on the evidence you've seen, who do you think or have the inclination into thinking is responsible? Well, by way of deception, thou shalt do war is the most sad slogan. I can't comment on the exact circumstance by which the attack happened. You know, I wasn't there. But I can guarantee you that... The people who set that red line, and I said this a year ago, that there was going to be a false flag against Syria with chemical weapons involved. The people who set that red line and set that condition and wanted those WMDs in the first place are the ones who pushed for this to happen. Um, I, can, you know, I can tell you that in Khan al-Asal, the incident that the UN was supposed to investigate in the first place, that was a government area that was struck. But as a, as a scientist, I suppose, I could, as a chemist as well, I can say that um, weapons-grade sarin or any or VX or any other kind of nerve agent mm. is very uh, indiscriminate and difficult to control. Mm. And from what I see, it, it would be... <laughs> extremely difficult for Syria to use this weapon on Damascus, on the capital city, where their soldiers are quite nearby. And none of the soldiers are wearing P- uh, PPE, like full uh, personal protective equipment. So 
it and and it was at the time when the UN first arrived in Syria under the invitation of the Syrian government. So it would boggle the mind for them to make his attack happen at such a convenient time and have the U.S. you know declare war. So it it it, it beggars belief. In in, yeah. in the situation in Gaza, people all the time say the Hamas regime. Now, in the Syrian context, people always say the Assad regime, which seems to me even more of a grave simplification. And I wondered, could you just give us an insight into how you, you see this use of language, quote unquote, Assad regime? I mean, is that what people see it like in Syria and in the Syrian diaspora? Well, certainly uh, not before the problem i mean we we saw it as the bath party you know the 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 regime basically not the assad regime i can say for sure that before 2011 assad enjoyed a lot of popularity i can say that with certainty and he was seen as a reformer and sort of a, a, a people's man he would go out to dinner with his wife in damascus in the street drive a normal car live in a, a downtown apartment so before the whole problems began no, definitely not. Now, you know, when you look at the insurgents, all they can focus on is Assad. And I think it's also partly because of the media. You know, uh, I think before any war sort of happened, they, they have to have a Hitler figure. And they have to go back in people's minds, back to the World War II, the righteous war. We need a Hitler figure to focus on and demonize. And we need a humanitarian thing to rescue these people. So I think that's why they they call it the Assad regime in the media. But anyone who understands about politics understands that it's not about a single person. How, how fair do you think the Western media coverage is, for example, the North American media coverage? I mean, is it giving people a kind of fairly dynamic insight into into the tragedy or not? Well, absolutely not. I mean, it, it's been forced to get better recently because there's been other medias out there that have um, sort of exposed a lot of their narratives as being false. Mm. And if they don't start, sh you know, showing part of that truth, they would, they're going to lose all credibility. But at the beginning of this whole thing, they were focusing on liars uh, like, I don't know if you've ever seen the CNN interviews with Danny abdul uh -huh. and how he was exposed as faking gunshots in the background of his interviews. And um, <laughs> it's all online. So, no, the media is, is first started pushing a narrative of democratic uprising which everybody supports no no black no gray not even a black you know it's just black and white and now yeah, it's, I mean, it's on to civil war you know shouldn't sunnis and shiites or sunnis and alawites and nothing in between they don't they'd rather just keep that narrative than do you agree with that that it's a civil war i think not i would say it's a proxy war and an insurgency and i wouldn't say it's a civil war because Civil war suggests that it's a war between civilians, um, civilian militias mm. and different sects of society, whether religious or racial. Just, just another a question about the media coverage. I mean, your narrative is definitely not the kind of one that we hear on BBC News in the UK or in, on CNN uh, in the United States every day. But what kind of headway have you been able to make for your narrative in the media? I mean, what kind of uh, places have you been able to get on air yourself? Well, I've been able to go on Press TV and RT um, and Infowars. All, and other independent media. I believe CNN rang me for a pre-interview recently, but I may have been too hard with the pre-interview, so okay. may have scared them off. We'll see. I've we'll never see heard that actually goes. of um, pre-interview process before. Interesting. Um, just coming back to uh, Israel uh, and Syria, is it true that the the Assad regime was basically not really a problem for Israel? I mean, Israel's practical security interests well you know this there is this conspiracy theory 
and it's prevalent in Syrian society a lot because Syrian society thrives on conspiracy theories, as does a lot of the Middle East, that the Assad government was secretly in collusion with Israel. And, you know, for the last 40 years, there hasn't been any fight against Israel. Well, let's examine that for a, for a minute. Um, during the Lebanese civil war, the Syrian military engaged the Israeli army. This was in the 80s. Um, during 2006, the Syrian military funded Hezbollah, which defeated Israel. Um, 73, of course, is well known, where the Gol parts of the Golan Heights were returned. So it's, um, there's, I could also give several examples where the Syrian government and military supported resistance movements and allowed them to stay inside Syria, including Hamas, including the PLO, including uh, the PFLP. Excuse me. So uh, this idea is kind of uh, put, put in, it's a, it's, it has a sectarian basis to do with Iran, I suppose, and it's put in there by Zionists to try to you know, mess up with people's minds and make them believe that they aren't really being supported by the imperialists, that they're actually fighting a resistance against the government. The Syrian government hasn't openly had a, an engagement with Israel like a full war since 73. And I think actually that was a great feat for them. Because Israel doesn't want peace. They want any way to try to gain more land and under the Zionist ideology. The, from the Nile to the Euphrates. So until we are strong enough to defeat Israel, we, it would be better for us to not start a war. But the fact that the, for this long, the, Syria has maintained um, a resistance stance and not had an altercation with the Zionist entity at the same time, that, that's a defeat, I think. That's a good thing. Indeed, I know that you have much sympathy for Palestinians who obviously do know war proper with the Zionist entity, with Israel. Uh, what's your, your, uh, your, your message to the Palestinian people, particularly the people in Gaza? Well, I think, I hope you know who your real friends are and who would never abandon you, that this Syria, you know, as it is now, not as a Saudi Arabian or a Qatari Syria, but an independent Syria would never let go of the Palestinian cause, would never make an alliance with Israel. And um, we see the Palestinian people as an extension of us, uh, as an extension of the Levant and the history of, of Syria, which is totally something that you will never find in the Gulf Arab states, because they don't have a historical connection to Palestine mm. or a cultural uh, connection as we do. Mm. I think that, uh, you know, it, it's clear if you listen to the, to the voices of Netanyahu and the U.S. and even people inside the, the Syrian so-called opposition, the, the SNC saying, you know, we will normalize relations with Israel once the war is over, um, and... Another wow. one saying, oh, you know, we see that we would rather have Ariel Sharon as our president, not Assad. <laughs> and then and another one saying, you know, actually, uh, our main problem is the Alawites, not the Israelis. That, that is, these are not uh, a friend of the Palestinian people. They are weakening the, any hope of real resistance. And we can see that now because... Uh, the Syrian military is being, des you know, d destroyed step by step. So how could, how could a destroyed Syria without an air force, without a deterrent, without an economy ever help the Palestinian people? This is a step backwards for sure. Turning to the American uh, situation and, and the, the, the listenership of this program, what's the most important thing to tell the audience of this program with regard to this situation in Syria, what's the number one thing that is hidden from most of the Western audiences with regard to Syria? Uh, certainly, I would love to say to any American listeners that uh, this U.S. government created al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, and since then, 
they have used it as a tool, either as a boogeyman to launch wars in different locations or as a proxy army, as they have used it in Afghanistan against the Russians and now against Libya and now Syria. And I, I hope that the, uh, the, that the American people see that the Al-Qaeda ideology has been uh, promoted and spread in the Middle East by organization, uh, media outlets such as Al Jazeera, which are in the U.S.'s back pocket because Al Jazeera is owned by Qatar, which is an allied country to the United States and has been pushing a lot of these uh, these Arab Spring revolutions um, and pushing them into a direction of extremism and, and this ideology. So I would like to, to push to, to say to the American people that you know the, your government all along. Mimi, that is Syrian girl partisan on Facebook. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Ah, well, that was fantastic. We were just listening to a pre-recorded interview that Harry conducted earlier today with Syrian Mimi Al-Laham, who is a blogger and commentator and who has appeared frequently on Press TV and RT, which is Russian TV today. Uh, her moniker on Twitter is Partisan Girl. I want to thank you, Harry, for conducting that interview, and I want to thank Mimi. Yeah, I think it was... Um radically, uh, in a way, shocking to, to, to hear, you know, uh, Mimi's commentary. And then at the same time, we hear, you know, on, on CNN or BBC, the, the average uh, messages and the average ideas, it kind of blows, blows your mind. But I think it's so important to, um, to big up the, the frame of reference, uh, to expand the frame of reference uh, with which we, we look at the Syrian situation when the stakes are so high, when the tragedy is so high, and when the question is set if there's to be a, a Western intervention. Oh, yeah, I mean, the stakes are extremely high. We saw that once with Iraq. Are we going to see it again now with Syria? We have now switched focus to Syria, and I'm delighted to have now to introduce Rania Masri. Let me tell you a little bit about her before I bring her on. Rania is an Arab-American human rights activist, environmental scientist, university professor, and writer. Since 2005, she has been chair of the Environmental Sciences Department at the University of Balaman in Lebanon. Before then, Rania directed the Southern Peace Research and Education Center at the Institute for Southern Studies in North Carolina. She has been an active act, activist against the wars in Iraq, Lebanon, and now Syria. Since May, she has been giving a series of talks about U.S. involvement in Syria. She has been representing a growing coalition of North Carolinians' social justice organizations against the war. So, Rania, thank you for joining us here today on Palestine Today. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Rania, what's your first reaction to some of the comments Mimi made? You know, I, I agreed with a lot of what she said, but, but I disagree with one critical point. I think it is necessary for those of us who are critical of a bombing campaign and who recognize what the U.S. and Saudi Arabian objectives are in Syria to also not paint the Syrian regime as angelic. This is a regime that has consistently, and particularly under Bashar al-Assad himself, I'm not even going to talk about the horrors of his father, but under Bashar al-Assad himself, this is a regime that has committed economic oppression, particularly through Bashar's new neoliberal economic agenda. This is a regime that has most definitely committed political oppression through its detentions, through its torture. And this is a regime that has been participating with the United States in rendition programs. Rendition programs are where the U.S. kidnaps individuals, sends them overseas, and has them be tortured under U.S. supervision to uh, get particular information. And Syria has been one of those countries that had been participating with the U.S. in this rendition program. So there's, there's no need to paint the Syrian government as angelic for us to stand in recognition of uh, the overall plan to divide Syria and to destroy it as a country and as a people, and for us also to recognize that any bombing and uh, campaign against Syria would be completely disastrous. Excellent. You're saying there's no need to paint the, the Syrian Assad regime as angelic. Um, well, you know, could you give – I heard an excellent 
uh, speech that you gave. It's on YouTube, actually, on September 9th. Also, I know you appeared on Democracy Now! I heard that speech. So can you give the U.S. listeners a sort of brief primer on this conflict that has been going on for two years? Well, I mean, there, there's two there's two frames through two windows that we can examine this. We can either say that this was a conflict that began two and a half years ago with what began as an internal uprising against the government, uh, an indigenous struggle for democracy and accountability. And at the same time, then, while there, what, there was this internal struggle, there also be, became certain defections from the Syrian army that um, resulted in an armed conflict more akin to a civil war. And at the same time as this was happening, there became an, in, an, an influx of foreign fighters funded by the Saudi Arabian regime and by the Qataris and assisted very much by the Turks and by the U.S. government and with a blind eye given to them by the Jordanian and by certain client political parties in Lebanon, so there became a flood of these foreign fighters into Syria, into then what has become a proxy war. And all three of these elements, both the uprising, the civil war, and the proxy war, became evident in Syria just a few months into the conflict. And we still have all three of these elements until now. Of course, now the most vibrant of these elements, the element that has gained the most attention, is the proxy war slash civil war, i.e. what we hear the most of, are these armed rebellion brigades. Sometimes we hear them referred to as the Free Syrian Army. Other times we hear about uh, Al-Nusra Front, which is an affiliate of Al-Qaeda. But that is what gets the most attention. What has been completely disavowed, uh, particularly in the mainstream press, is the non-violent civil society movement in Syria. And this has been ongoing for decades, and not only for the past two and a half years. And this is a movement that believes very much in a political process for transformation and not an armed process. And, of course, I would argue that the vast majority of Syrians um, subscribe to or are supporters of this nonviolent civil society movement. But, Rania, now, there's, what's there's, left of that nonviolent movement? Well, no, Rania, they Yeah, the nonviolent movement still exists and in very, very different forms. You, you have some of them who exist within the Syrian government themselves, as internal opposition. You have a large community of them which exists outside uh, the Syrian government as external opposition. They're represented by writers and novelists and and by community-led organizations. They do still exist. Um, You know, they are subverted and and they are caught between the crossfire, between both the Syrian army and, most tragically, also between these so-called um, you know, armed brigades uh, who have sold their blood and sold any semblance of an uprising, you know, sold it literally to the Saudis and the Qataris and the Americans and the Turks, most definitely. But I want to say there's another framing of the conflict, and it's an important framing. Um, you, your guest and yourself spoke about the statement by, by U.S. Army General Wesley Clark in 2001 that spoke about U.S. plans to attack and destroy the governments of seven nations, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. And this plan has been ongoing since then. Uh, You know, we've heard, we know about it in Iraq. We might know some of it in Lebanon. We might know some of it in Sudan and Libya. But it has been very, very uh, consistent with regards to Syria. Um, And I would urge people, I mean, I can talk about it in more detail, but I would urge people to simply Google it and and research it. Because there is also that framing. There, There has been a concerted effort Um, since at least 2001, if not since the early 1990s, to cause a regime change in Syria, not out of love of democracy or human rights, and this is critical, not out of love of democracy and human rights, but rather to simply weaken any symbol, any symbol of resistance within Syria to cut all Syrian ties with Hezbollah and to create a fully client regime in Syria akin to the client regime in Jordan. And, you know, something that I've noticed before, I've picked up before, is that you said that the United States or the mainstream media has consistently, or rather the West, has consistently characterized this as sort of a binary situation. Yeah. Yeah. Can you clarify that for listeners? Touch on it and clarify it. Well, you know, we're told time and time again, President Obama loves to repeat this, but we've even heard it repeated by the mainstream press, including the so-called leftist guardian, which is no longer leftist in any way, in which they repeat the claim that the Syrian government has killed 100,000 people. And if we are to believe that, then we would you know, recognize that there must have been no Syrian army combatant fatalities that all the 100,000 people that have been killed have been killed directly because of the Syrian army itself. 
However, the numbers do not show that. According to the same source that gave us the 100,000 fatality number, we know that 43% of that 100,000 are actually pro-Syrian army combatants. Another 14% are recognized by this pro-opposition source to be actually rebel combatants. And without going into the detail of how they approach this number, we can very conservatively say that at least 60% of the 100,000 figure are actually army combatants, be they Syrian army or rebel brigades, and not civilians. And the ratio hasn't even been one-to-one -one or two-to-one. The vast majority of those killed by, I mean, not the vast majority, but at least half of those killed mm. in the 100,000 figure have actually been pro-Syrian army combatants. And I think Which, when we look at that, it shifts it from being an evil dictator conducting these massacres to it being at least two warring parties. And then when we look at who actually comprises this free Syrian army and this rebel brigades, and we see that at least, at least, according to Secretary of State John Kerry, at least 15% of these so-called rebel brigades are actually known terrorists, operating either with al-Qaeda or operating to the right of al-Qaeda, at least 15% of them. And the others whom Secretary of State John Kerry considers to be moderate, inclusive within these so-called moderate armed brigades, are examples of, of horror stories, such as the example of, of the Syrian rebel that actually ate the heart and lung of the Syrian soldier. And that is recognized as an example of moderation among the rebel brigades. That was one of the moderate votes. So when we place all this into perspective, we realize that this binary of evil dictator against, you know, liberation revolutionaries is completely false. It's more nuanced than that. In other words, Assad, the Assad regime is not nice, isn't a good guy. And also the forces that have been killed, the 100,000, 60 percent of those consist of rebels who are fighting. No, no. 60 percent of them include the army combatants. 43 percent of them are army combatants. 14% of them are rebels. So 60% includes armed militants, armed individuals, combatants, basically. So we, we, when we use the figure 100,000, the implication is that 100,000 civilians have been killed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is false. That has not been supported by opposition figures. Whereas it's more like 40,000, which doesn't work so well for the interventionist propaganda machine. Well, even that, I don't want to minimize 40,000. Yeah, I mean, exactly. one death Indeed. is one death too many. I don't want to minimize it. I'm simply highlighting how that figure has been used to serve a binary that is in and of, in and of itself quite inaccurate because it, it serves the point of simply placing all the responsibility at the hands of the Syrian government. And while the Syrian government is guilty of human rights atrocities, no doubt, both during these past two and a half years and before, they are by far not the only guilty parties. And so for those of us who want to work towards an end of the violence in Syria, we need to recognize that we need to be working on all fronts in Syria and not only giving attention to the Syrian government itself. In other words, it's not simplistic. We must look at it in a nuanced and detailed and more specific way to resolve it. We can't just go along with the soundbites that we are presented. So now let's turn to this issue about the chemical weapons. What, highlight that issue. Give us some insight into what's going on with the chemical weapons. We've, we were told by President Obama in his speech that he delivered to the American people that they know with 100 percent certainty, definitively, the Assad regime has released these chemical weapons. What do you say about that? Well, you know, I'm going to repeat what Representative Alan Grayson, Democratic representative from the state of Florida, said. If that is the case, why has the White House not shared the so-called classified information with members of Congress? Where is the evidence? According to Alan Grayson, all that has been presented to Congress is circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial. And again, I'm not even arguing that the White House should be presenting the evidence to us, the American public, the way our, you know, they should. But when they're not even presenting evidence to the members of Congress, then it really raises an issue that they must not have the evidence. When members of Congress ask for it and they get nothing but circumstantial information, when the White House dossier is being explained to by Alan Grayson as simply reasons, arguments, quote, I'm quoting him here, arguments in favor of attacking Syria and not evidence itself that the Syrian government was guilty of this chemical attack then one has to wonder where this evidence is. And we see that again. This is the second time the Obama administration claimed that the Syrian government committed 
chemical weapons, use chemical weapons. And in both instances, no evidence was given. Absolutely no evidence was given. The first instance was used as a pretext by the U.S. administration to officially begin arming and training these so-called rebels in Syria. And the second pretext here was used um, to uh, push support for a, a bombing campaign against Syria. And I believe that the administration was completely surprised by the level of both domestic and international opposition to a bombing campaign against Syria. And so circumstantial evidence is not sufficient for a country to go, for the United States to go to war. The American people have said that. However, and also I'd like to add, and also Obama has now put a pause on the fact of going to Congress and asking for their authorization to execute a strike. Well, what two points if I made of that. Even if there were unrefutable evidence that the Syrian government were guilty, that would not legally suffice for a reason to go to war against Syria. Neither, and it would not suffice legally because international law states that there has to be UN Security Council resolution approval, and it would not suffice constitutionally here because the president would need to get congressional approval. And it wasn't the president that postponed the congressional vote. It was his knowledge that he simply did not have the votes, neither in the Senate or the House. And if he had chosen to dismiss the congressional opposition to this a bombing campaign against Syria and gone ahead with a bombing campaign, he would have been guilty of violating the U.S. Constitution. Because even President Obama recognized in his speech to the public that Syria does not pose an imminent threat to the United States. And so long as there is no imminent threat, direct quote, no imminent threat, then the president is obligated by the U.S. Constitution to seek congressional approval. He knew he could not get that congressional approval thereby he postponed the vote. Oh, I thought, it, he, I thought the, Obama said in his speech that it did pose an imminent threat to uh, our... No, no, no. No, he said it did not? He said it did not pose an imminent threat. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So That's definitely a, a, a backstepping. Run, run, well, I, I wanted to... Do, go ahead, go ahead. He, Obama never claimed it posed an imminent threat to national security. He was touting national security, but he never specifically used that language. I mean, th th this is a... It, I, I don't want to be being nitpicky about words, but, but the language that's used here becomes really, really key. Mm -hmm. uh, he claimed that we need to be going to this bombing campaign to set a message to Iran and to others. You mm -hmm. know, he was using that kind of language. But in terms of an imminent threat to national security, that was never claimed. Mm -hmm. I think it was Kerry that, that used, the, used the phrase uh, threat to our national security, but perhaps without imminent. But mm -hmm. the, the question I wanted to ask you was, how do you read the trajectory here? Because the, the rebels, or whatever you want to call them, certainly aren't going away. The Assad regime, whatever you want to call that, has its loyalists who will, in their at least tens of thousands, die for him. And at the same time, there's now a big question mark with any intervention. So how do you see things will progress? I mean, Assad isn't going to go away, which is presumably what the Western powers would like. Well, I'm not quite sure what the Western powers would like, actually. Um, and one of the objectives that they may have is to see the complete destruction of Syria and to, to, to continue to have people killing each other. Um, if the United States really did want a shift in the balance of power, then they would not have waited two and a half years to begin talk of a bombing campaign. I believe that one of their ulterior objectives is to see the complete destruction of Syria and then to work towards a regime change. Now, ironically, the, these, these so-called opposition groups who have been funded and supported and arguably represent the interest of Saudi Arabia much more than they represent the interest of the Syrian people, they have gone on record now as to say that they are opposed to this Russian proposal that has been agreed on by the Syrian government and by the Americans. And one military council official said, and I'm quoting, let the Kerry Lavrov plan go to hell. We reject it and we will not protect the inspectors or let them enter Syria. So this here then raises another issue. What if the inspectors go to Syria and are shot at by these so-called moderate U.S.-supported, Saudi-funded rebels in Syria, and then the United States accuses the Syrian government of hindering the inspection. And I'm not raising this simply as a conspiracy theory, but those of us who've been involved with the Iraq sanctions and the 13 years of sanctions that were imposed on Iraq, we understand very well how inspecting, inspecting weapons of so-called mass destruction in Iraq was used so often as a pretext for a bombing campaign, and, and this has been documented extensively. So some of us, myself included, become worried when 
there is talk of UN weapons inspectors because we hope it won't be used as another false flag, another false pretext for another bombing campaign. As to where we're going now, I think when we look at this Russian proposal, we can see that it has shown the powers of a political settlement and of a negotiated settlement. And what we all need to be calling for very much, all of us, particularly those of us that live in this country, in the United States, is we need to be demanding from our congressional representatives to stop training and arming these so-called rebels, these so-called moderate and terrorist forces in Syria. That is how we get people to the negotiating table. There is only one group right now that is opposed to negotiation, and it is not the Syrian government. It's not the Russians. It's not the Iranians. It is the Saudi and U.S. funded and supported external opposition. And actually, I just recently saw a post that indicated that the rebels that the Assad regime has been wanting to negotiate a political settlement or uh, understanding or, to this situation, and yet the rebels have been opposing a settlement, political settlement. Very much so. Both the armed opposition within Syria and the so-called Syrian National Council, again, which is a Saudi-supported external opposition, have claimed that they cannot go to the negotiating table until Bashar al-Assad um, openly states that, that he will step down and come up with a transition government. And even though he has stated that there will be elections in 2014, and he has done numerous kinds of political compromises, they are still insisting on a precondition that is not part of the Geneva conditions, not part of the Geneva conferences that were agreed on by the Russians and the Americans, although they claim that it was part of the Geneva conditions. And, and anyone can actually read the Geneva communique to realize that they're, they're flat out lying. What these opposition groups are interested in is simply... Uh, a regime change in their favor, regardless what the cost is to the Syrian people and to Syria as a nation. The vast majority of Syrians, both those supporting Bashar al-Assad and those in opposition to Bashar al-Assad, stand united in calling for a ceasefire, in calling for a halt to all kinds of violence, and in calling for a negotiated settlement. Rania, I just want you to, in less than one minute, because we don't have enough time to spend the rest of the show on this, which is only a few minutes, just talk about the, the Qatari interest and why they're pumping money uh, into this oppo opposition militant sea. Well, both Qatar and Saudi Arabia are, are pumping money, and I believe that they simply want to see themselves as another regional power. And they're using sectarian language that has not been endemic in the region, to, to create this idea that it's a Sunni-Shia divide when it is not at all the case. But they, they're after typical political powers and, and regional games. Now, Saudis, though, they, they have a different objective. Bandar bin Sultan, who's the main financier of these so-called rebels, was also the main financier of the Contras in Nicaragua and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. So here, here's a man who has a very long history in supporting terrorism, both in Nicaragua, and we have seen the consequences of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And what about Israel's policy towards this? We know it's evolved somewhat from neutral to sort of pro-strike. How do you see uh, Israel's position? Well, Israel's position is quite clear. They want to, to see a continuation of the killing and a continuation of the chaos in Syria. Their ultimate objective would, to see, would be to see Syria broken up and to see Syria dismantled chaotically and destructively. That is their, uh, their objective here. Okay, I want to thank you, Rania. You know, if we do decide to strike Syria, I want to give you an open invitation to come back on Palestine today. This is so critical. This is so crucial. We already have Iraq as an example. The American people are opposed to war, and yet there are forces that are trying to push us into war. We didn't. Can you just briefly say who those forces are and why? I'll give you. Can you do that in 30 seconds? I may be pushing it, but. You think yes, you can? I, I want to say one thing, though. There has never, ever been this level of opposition from the American public towards any war as there has been towards this war on Syria. That is very powerful, and a momentum must be built. As for the factors that win, those that represent the military-industrial complex definitely stand to gain financially. Those that represent external interests, be they Saudi or Qatari or Turkish or Israeli, also stand to win. Those that represent the interest of people, of conscience, of the United States as a community, as a nation, and of the Arabs themselves, again, as people, stand to lose. And therefore, we need to stand in solidarity together.
Okay, thank you, Rania, for joining us on Palestine Today. You have an open invitation. We definitely want to explore this issue, a strike on Syria. If a strike actually does occur, we want to bring you back on. So I also want to say to listeners, don't forget to join the healthy, what is it, challenge to be healthy. Uh, I'm going to lose 20 pounds, but don't tell anyone. And you can go to palestinetoday.my90forlife.com to join this challenge with me. So thank you for joining us, Rania. Thank you, Mimi. And thank you, Cal. Thank you, Harry, my co-host. Thank you. Hi, Harry. Oh, Harry's gone. Harry left. He didn't. Okay, everyone's gone. So we've got 15 seconds. I want to say join me next week on Palestine Today. We'll have a fabulous show for you. Thank you very much. Bye. You're on board KCAA's Inland Talk Express. KCAA, Loma Linda, 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. From the KCAA Weather Center, I'm Rod Tanner. For this afternoon, nearly mostly sunny and hot with a high of 103. Clear skies are on tap for tonight, a low 74. Sunday continues to be mostly sunny and very warm with a high of 89. On a party cloudy conditions, Sunday night with a low of 71. Monday looks mostly sunny, not as hot with a high of 95. On a party cloudy conditions, Monday night a low 70. Tuesday should be mostly sunny, warm day with a high of 92. Wednesday will have mostly sunny skies and a high of 91. That's your weather forecast for this hour from the station that leaves no listener behind. NBC News Radio, AM 1050, KCAA. This is the KCAA Community Calendar. Join the next Believe Walk on Sunday, October 6th in the city of Redlands and help raise awareness and funds for local cancer-fighting organizations to ensure that the Inland Empire communities have the best cancer-fighting resources in Southern California. The Believe Walk registration opens at 6.30 a.m. and the walk begins at 8 a.m. The Believe Walk will start in downtown Redlands at State and Orange Street and finish at the Redlands Bowl. The online registration deadline is September 30th. That's the 6th Annual Believe Walk on Sunday, October 6th in the City of Redlands. For more information, go to BelieveInlandEmpire.com. And that's your KCAA Community Council.